In a continuation of our air conditioning troubleshooting videos, we're now going to talk about some other refrigeration and begin to talk about airflow problems. So let's start off with the easy one, liquid line restrictions. A liquid line restriction can be caused by a multitude of things, okay? This can include a restricted filter dryer, easiest ones to find, a restricted thermostatic expansion valve screen, a kinked liquid line, a kinked or bent U-bend in the lower condenser coil, a restricting solder joint in the liquid line, or an oil-clogged capillary tube. All of this can cause restrictions to the refrigeration flow. Now, restricted filter line dryer, uh, we've already talked about this. Put a temperature probe on each side of the um, filter dryer. If you have a temperature difference, it's restricted. A restricted um, thermostatic expansion valve screen, that's the screen that's on the inlet of the TXV. That's a little bit more difficult to find because you have a temperature drop normally across the TXV. But the bottom line is you're going to have to recover the system or pump it down and inspect that screen if you suspect that that's the issue. A kinked liquid line, normally very easy to find. Someone hit it with a lawnmower. A kinked or bend U-bend at the lower condenser coil. Again, you can find this by looking for it. This is visual. A restricted soldering joint in the liquid line. Someone may have used too much braze when they assembled the system or even forgot to remove a cap, you know, the shipping caps, and things got stuck in there. Okay, this should have been found at system startup, but let's say it was late in the year or someone didn't start it up properly. What you really need to do is look for temperature differences. A restricted solder joint will very, will very often show up as frost on the liquid line because it's actually metering. An oil logged capillary tube, again, you, this is one you're going to have to just look for after you rule everything else out. A restricted liquid line will starve the evaporator of refrigerant and it will cause low pressures in the evaporator. Once the evaporator is starved, the compressor and the condenser will also be starved of refrigerant. The evaporator will not be able to absorb as much heat for the condenser to reject. Most of the refrigerant will be in the condenser, not necessarily causing high discharge pressures though, because most condensers are sized that they can hold 100% of the charge of the system. Because the refrigerant is remaining in the condenser longer, the subcooling will increase. Remember, subcooling is sensible heat change. The longer the refrigerant is in the condenser to have that air exchange with the lower temperature ambient air, the greater the subcooling. The subcooling is the big difference between an undercharge of refrigerant and a liquid line restriction. And we'll talk more about this. But high subcooling with symptoms of the same symptoms in terms of pressures of an undercharge of refrigerant. Okay, it's a liquid line restriction. When a system is undercharged, the refrigerant that is in the system flows through the condenser much faster and has a lower subcooling. When a system has a liquid line restriction, the refrigerant stays in the condenser longer and has a high subcooling. In case of a system with a receiver, and there's not many of these on air conditioning, this condition would also decrease the head pressure, which is the high side pressure. Other symptoms of liquid line restrictions include a local cool spot just after the severe restriction. This is caused by expansion of the refrigerant from the restriction's low pressure drop. Low ambient draw at the compressor from reduced refrigerant flow through it. A hot compressor, especially most compressors being refrigerant cooled. Bubbles in the sight glass if the restriction is before the sight glass. Most people are not installing sight glasses these days because bubbles do not always mean a low charge, and a lot of times customers think that. High superheats from a starved evaporator. Low to normal head pressures from liquid backed up in the condenser if the system has a receiver. Now on the opposite side of the system, the suction line is much more sensitive to restrictions than the liquid line. This is because it is a lower pressure and carries vapor instead of liquid. You have to remember though, as we look at this, it's also pretty critical because the suction line is responsible for oil return to the compressors in most systems. 
A restricted suction line will starve the compressor and condenser of refrigerant. This will cause a low amp draw on the compressor because of having less work to do. The condensing pressures will also be low. The evaporator will not have enough refrigerant flow. And you almost think about that, that the evaporator would be fuller, but it won't. It won't have enough refrigerant flowing through it. This reduced evaporator flow will increase the superheat. Again, superheat is dependent on how much, how fast the refrigerant is flowing through the system. Suction line restrictions are caused most often by restricted or dirty suction line and cleanup filters. The condensing pressure will be low, along with low compressor amp draws. The condenser subcooling will be normal to a bit high. The condenser subcooling allows the technician to differentiate between a low charge and a suction line restriction. Other causes may not be as visible as a kinked suction line. You can have internal restrictions such as bad solder joints and non-functioning access valves. Sometimes you come across shipping caps that were not removed before the line set was brazed on. Suction line restrictions are the restrictions that can cause damage to a compressor. Suction line restrictions can cause a buildup and migration of oil to the evaporator, allowing the compressor to run with low oil levels. The problem of low oil is compounded in the refrigerant cooled compressor because it will continue to run and the compressor will overheat. Now undercharge systems also are important and again we have to when we do this we have to make sure we're not looking at a kinked line because some of the characteristics are close. Okay, undercharge systems will cause a lower mass, that's a volume of refrigerant to move through the entire system. Low suction and discharge pressures and low compressor amp draws are all signs of undercharge systems. Low suction pressure can cause a significant drop in evaporator temperature and it can cause ice to form. Once ice forms, the temperatures and pressures will continue to drop and cause further problems. Severely undercharged systems will have very low condenser subcooling because of the fast flow of refrigerant through the condenser. The less time the refrigerant stays in the condenser, the lower the heat rejection and the lower the subcooling. If the subcooling drops to zero, it means that the hot vapor refrigerant entering the top of the condenser will flow fast enough that it will not fully condense and it will start entering the liquid line at the bottom of the condenser. Sometimes an undercharged system will appear the same as a liquid line restriction. The difference will be subcooling. An undercharged system will have a lowest subcooling. A liquid line restriction will have a high subcooling. There's your difference between an undercharge system and a liquid line restriction. Now an overcharge system has some significant differences. A system with an overcharge will have a higher than normal condensing temperature because the liquid will be backing up into the condenser, robbing the condenser of surface area. The amp draw of the compressor will increase because of the increased head pressure. The entire system will have reduced efficiencies. If a system is more than 10% overcharged, liquid can get into the suction valves in the compressor as well as the crankcase and cause compressor damage. Most TXV systems will attempt to maintain a superheat for a minor overcharge. Once the system is 10, more than 10% overcharged, the TXV will feed too much refrigerant into the evaporator, lowering the superheat. Fixed metering devices will not maintain correct superheats if overcharged. Before doing any refrigerant diagnostics, it's important to understand if you have enough airflow across the evaporator coil. Low airflow gives additional time for refrigerant to absorb the heat from the air flowing across the coil. Low airflow will be in contact with the coil longer and the temperature difference between the supply and return will be greater. Think about it, the longer air, which is an object with mass, or a substance with mass, sits on that evaporator coil, the more heat is gonna be pulled out of it. So the difference between my supply air and my return air temperatures will be greater than normal. Low airflow can cause ice to form on the coil, blocking the fins and making the pro 
problem pr progressively worse. Once ice has formed on the coil, it is possible for low airflow problems to appear to be refrigerant charge issue rather than airflow. This is why we suggest you always start your diagnosis with the air handler. You have to make sure that that is functioning correctly with airflow before you can move on to refrigeration. Low airflow can be caused by dirty filters, closed registers, blocked grills, or collapsed ductwork. High airflow problems are not normally found in residential applications unless there's been damage to the ductwork or manual intervention. Le severely leaking ductwork, where pieces are missing, incorrect motor speed adjustments, and other such issues are signs of high airflow. Higher than normal airflow will show as low temperature difference between supply and return air temperatures. The greater than normal airflow will also result in lower dehumidification and in an increase of humidity in the conditioned space.